Hello, everybody. This is Gary Wilson, and welcome to tonight's uh, live weekly Q&A webinar for the Investor Agent Training Program. And again, from time to time, we'll have some veterans on board and also those who have been through the program on how to buy rentals. Um, some of you are going to be participating in the program starting next week on how to buy flips. So, so this is, of course, an in-depth program with a lot more detail. We're going to focus on that particular subject as if you were investors because some of you actually are ready to invest. Um, that's why we're doing it. The one on rentals we did last year, um, and I, I know I told you I'm going to make it available to you. It's already produced. There's no development program there. It's already been developed. Um, I'm not purposely trying to hold it back from you. I do want you guys to have what you've been asking for. Uh, we're just waiting for it from the from the uh, from the publisher. It's already been developed, edited the whole nine yards, um, and as soon as it's ready, we'll put it out there for you guys so you can take a look at it and see if you're interested in, in delving deeper into the rental business. Um, so for tonight, uh, uh, again, we're going to get into um, uh, first subject is doing physical analysis. We'll focus on the flips for tonight because that seems to be a hot topic and. Again, some of you are focused or are going to be taking the, the FLIP program and being part of that development starting Monday night. If you want to be a part of that and you haven't signed up yet, please look through your emails and just let Beverly know so she can process it. It's a, it's a pretty dramatic discount on a normal cost for that. Um, but again, some of you are ready, so uh, you know we won't hold it back anymore. Um, also, we'll talk about another marketing tech we, technique, which is a spinoff on the on the monthly workshop that we have you guys promote some of you guys are actually doing workshops multiple weeks out of the month you've discovered that you can create your initial splinter group or excuse me your, your your initial niche group and then splinter off from that and create what's called splinter groups and a good example is uh, one of our students um, out in Ohio started a an investor group for retired military I think it was retired Air Force actually and then went ahead and after a few months started um, uh, reserves uh, uh, investor workshop for reserves in his community okay and last I heard he was going to do one for active duty after that active duty would be a big group that that's not really a niche that's a that's considered a subgroup because it could be quite large um, but maybe he's ready for it so we're gonna, the, the subject is um, how do you turn that into an actual class format and this came up last week up in Massachusetts in our mastermind and it came up again this week in Pennsylvania so I thought you know what I, I already gonna, was going to talk about it and uh, I brought it up last week. People seem to love the, the concept. And so I'm going to go ahead and give you some details on how to set up your own class, even if you're not uh, an expert. Okay. You're, you're, I'm going to have you walk through certain fundamentals on flips, certain fundamentals on rentals, and certain fundamentals on, on wholesaling. And you can teach uh, each of three weeks in a month. You know, one week would be flips, one week would be rentals, one week would be wholesaling. And the fourth week, you actually take people out in the field and go look at properties and so forth. It's a great way to develop a following and service them. I know people that do this around the country who never even invested themselves, okay? Uh, matter of fact, I did an interview last night with a with another agent from the New England area. Her name's Kelly O'Keefe. She's a KW agent. She doesn't invest, and yet she's been working with investors for 10 years, and she teaches and coaches and mentors and all kinds of stuff. Never invested a property in her, in her life, okay? So you can definitely do it. Okay, uh, sorry to ramble there. I just want to give you a little intro about what we're doing tonight. So the first thing is this. You will see on your screen a, a, uh, an example of a rehab worksheet that's already filled out, okay? And this is the, this is the final version of analysis that I do on any property that I ever flipped um, or who, you know, whenever I've helped investors flip a property and also when I teach people how to um, flip properties and teach people how to help other people flip properties, runs the gamut. Everybody gets the same form. Um, now this one is an example of one going back several years. So these prices that I'm looking at here may or may not be accurate. I mean, every region in the country is different. Um, you know, from time to time, the cost of materials may go up or down. Um, I'll give you an example. Let's see, drywall is in here right here. Uh, drywall installed says 27 a sheet. That's installed, okay? Now, years ago, you could get drywall for under $5 for a 4 by 8 sheet that was half-inch drywall. And then it went up to, like, over $8 a sheet, okay? And then it went back down again. It just fluctuates wildly. Another good example would be gutters, particularly um. Uh, those that are aluminum, and most of them are, um, 
it, the price goes up and down, okay? Um, you've seen the price of copper go up and down, so plumbing, anything that, that has to do with uh, traditional plumbing material, uh, i.e. copper, um, you know, could go up and down here. You can see the price down here, all right? So in any case, I want to go over uh, what you actually do when you're looking at a property when you're doing a physical analysis. Now, if you think back to last week, I gave you the kind of the high level view of, of the 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 um, steps you go through in a what order. And the steps, again, just to repeat, when you're looking at a property, you always start on the outside first. In fact, I'll just walk you through exactly what I've done with a client. So let's say you're driving down the street, you're driving up to the property, okay? You actually want to start taking notes as soon as you pull up in front of the property. Pull up on the street, don't pull in the driveway, just pull up on the street and make note of the curb appeal. And you actually, if there's problems with the curb, you may want to make note of that actually. You make note of the driveway, you make note of the, the, the mailbox, okay? You make note of the lawn, the shrubbery, flowers, trees, anything that's out there, the sidewalk to the house, um, and, and of course, the then you're up to the house, okay? That's the beginning. Um, so, in any case, uh, before I ever go in, I want to go around the outside first. Now, I walk up to the house first because any consumer who's eventually going to buy the house is going to walk through those exact steps. They're going to go from the car to the driveway to the sidewalk to the front door. And the front door is actually the first physical contact with the building. They actually touch the doorknob. Now, I know that sounds weird that I say it like that, but that's actually very important because what happens as soon as they grab that doorknob, there's an emotional trigger that, that occurs in the mind, okay? Once they touch that, physically touch that house, um, if they already like what they see, that, that physical contact with the front doorknob, um, that's why, by the way, I always let the consumer open the door, okay? I let them grab the doorknob, open the door, and push it open. Um, I want them to get the feel of it, okay? So, uh, but by the way, that's on. That's once it's rehab. Before it's rehab, I open the door first because you don't know what's going to jump out at you <laughs> sometimes. In any case, uh, so back to what I was saying. Um, I go through that process the same way that a consumer is going to go through when they come up to the property once it's rehab. Now, on the front end, when we're doing the initial analysis, I actually will stop there, go back out, and walk around the building, look at the outside, okay? And let's just go this through this step by step. The first thing I want to try to determine is, um, is the yard sloping towards the house or sloping away from the house? You, you, you really want to stay away from a yard that's sloping towards the house if at all possible, especially if it's sloping right up to the house. That, that's, a, that's a big red flag, particularly in older, older areas of the country, okay? Um, and uh, the, the next thing I do is if I determine that that passes the muster, you know, in other words, it's a... Uh, there's at least some slope away from the house. That's a good sign because the water has a, a less likely chance of penetrating the foundation walls. All right? um, now, the next thing I do is I try to gain a vantage point on the roof because roofing can be big, expensive work, dirty work, hard work, permits, dumpsters, the whole nine yards. Okay. So if I can find a vantage point on the roof, now I'm not going to climb on a ladder, and I don't expect my clients to either although we have some clients who will do that. I want to find a vantage point. I always will take binoculars with me, so I'll write that down. That way you or your client, and always, and by the way, everything I'm teaching you is intended for you to teach your clients. So have them bring an op binoculars. Have them bring a flashlight. Have them bring a notepad, pencil, paper, calculator, everything. Get, make their, sure they're prepared to do the analysis on a property, right? So when I'm looking at the roof, you know, there's different, all kinds of roof material. Let's just take, for example, uh, traditional asphalt shingle roofs, which is pretty common all across North America, um, U.S. and Canada, coast to coast. Um, some areas of the country, like down in Florida, you'll have a more variety of roofing, um, like metal roofs, for example, are more popular down there, and of course, out in California. But in any case, what I'm looking for is I'm trying to determine uh, how dated the roof is. So what I'm looking for are missing shingles. That's the first thing to look for because it's so obvious. Look for missing shingles, okay? And then through your binoculars, look at the shingles that are there and see if they look pitted and pocked. If they're pitted and pocked. In other words, like like pieces of the granules, you know, looks like they're missing in slots. Looks like a, maybe a hailstorm hit it or something. Okay, that's a sign that the roofing is, is pretty well aged, all right? You're also looking at shingles that are curling, curling up on the corners. That usually means that they've been out there for quite a while. All right. Now, 
the steeper the pitch of a roof, usually the longer it will last. And the further north you go, you will find more roofs with steeper pitches because there's more snow and the snow gets heavier the further north you go. Okay. Um, so in any case, if you see signs, of, if you see missing shingles, if you see shingles with the corners curled up, if you see shingles that look pitted and pocked, I would assume that you need a new roof and I would write that down. New roof required. Okay. Um, now when I'm looking at the, uh, the windows, here's what I'm looking for on windows. I, can, I start on the outside, of course, because that's where I am at the point. At that point, and I'm looking to see if they're if what I want to see is more more modern windows. You know, uh, vinyl clad aluminum, usually maintenance free, um, completely wrapped. I don't want to see windows with any real wood uh, trim because that means it's going to require maintenance long term, like painting and so forth, scraping and painting and sometimes replacing wood, because wood gets rotten. So I like to see windows where the framing is completely wrapped, wrapped in aluminum, okay? Uh, aluminum flashing. And in the window itself, I like to see modern double pane windows that are vinyl, at least vinyl clad, all right? Um, that's what I'm looking for. If they're older windows, like old wooden sash windows, single pane windows, assume that you're going to replace those, okay? Um, now on the siding, what I'm looking for is I generally don't like aluminum siding. It's just, um, if, if there's any damage to it, like a baseball or a bad hailstorm, it just, you know, a branch falling off a tree, aluminum doesn't give back. It just basically bends. And once it's bent, it just bent forever. You can't unbend it. Okay. You're always going to see the bend. Also, um, it, the painting on it will tend to fade a lot over the years very quickly. Um. It's just an older style. People still put on aluminum siding. I just prefer not to, to, to I don't like it. I don't want to use it, okay? Um, so if I see that or old, you know, in some of the older parts of the country, typically in the east and northeast, you'll see houses that still have wooden siding, all right? I don't like to see that either. I'm going to assume I'm going to uh, put some new vinyl siding on that. So if you see the old siding, assume you're going to replace it, all right? Now, at this point, that really is pretty much the exterior of the house. Okay, you've got the, the siding, the windows, the roofing, and on the inside, you're going to look at the windows a little bit more, by the way. Um, you've, you've looked at the yard. Um, it's easy to determine what has to be done on landscaping. Now, let me check real quick here before I jump on the inside and see what kind of questions we have. Um, okay, this is from Sue. Uh, hi, Sue. This, and I think, Sue, you're up in Canada. Um, let's see here. Oh, you actually got it right here, Ontario. That's I thought I knew who you were. Okay. Hi, Gary. Do you know of a resource in Ontario where we can get up to up to date cost estimates? So actually, the good news for you is, um, and actually this is true in most parts of of uh, Canada, certainly all in Ontario, and for those of you who are in Ottawa, um, even up in Montreal, we got students up in Montreal. Quebec's a little bit different, um, but in any case. And you're in Ontario, so let's answer that question there. You actually have a lot of the same stores that, that are, exist down in the States. You know, you've got Lowe's, Home Depot. There's other, other Canadian um, specific stores that are there for home improvements. Typically, so what they'll have is they'll have either a what's called a bid room. Um, they also will have a, um, a site you can go to or a page on their, on their site where you can enter in all the things that you need. and they'll tell you how much they cost, what the material cost is, okay? You can also go to, I would go to visit them in person initially and ask them, say, can you give me, um, a, you know, a basic rundown on the average cost for these items? And you could show them, that matter of fact, could you just show them the sheet? It's right out of your training manual. Take the sheet in there. And um, you can, uh, I think you get a blank when you do get a blank word version of it. Take it in there and see if they usually have a guy at a help desk or if not, they'll have somebody at the commercial desk. And they can give you a rough idea of what it takes, material and even labor, like like drywall, for example. They'll tell you right now what it costs to hang drywall in Ontario, the average cost per sheet. They can even recommend contractors. Now, I wouldn't take their contractors at face value. You always want to join your local investor club and get to know a couple of the contractors, get to know other investors and ask them who they've used and who they're happy with, okay? But that really, I mean, you can, there's other online sources that'll give you uh, uh, figures and estimates, but honestly, we've learned over the years that a lot of times they can be out of date. Now, this is very out of date here. I would, some of this may be accurate, but a lot of this is gonna be old. Um, 
you're actually better off going into one of those big stores because you can do it once and you're good. For, those, those costs are usually pretty good for a while. I mean, some of them fluctuate more than others, but for the for the most part, they should, every year if you updated that, you'd be in good shape. And that's what I would do, okay? Um, actually, I would encourage you to have your, your, your investors do that, okay? So in any case, excellent question, Sue, by the way. Very good. Okay, now back to here. Once I go on the inside, you know, I know that everybody is very interested in kitchens and bathrooms, and I understand that, but we're going to actually go into the utility areas first. If there's basements, in most, most places of the country um, have homes with basements. Some parts of the country do not have basements at all, particularly those areas that are close to the coast, um, particularly the East Coast. East Coast homes right on the beach generally don't have basements. Very, very few do. Um, there's also other parts of the country where they built slab homes, homes that are literally on a concrete slab, even in the middle of the country. I've seen them in Ohio, Indiana. Um, I've seen them everywhere. You know, there's a lot of them out in California. But either in either case, it doesn't matter. There's either going to be a basement or a utility area that has the HVAC, which is your furnace and air conditioning, and also your electrical panel and also your hot water tank. Okay. Um, sometimes you have areas of the country where there are uh, water softeners because of the nature of the water, all right? Um, and what I do is I always go to look at those first before I get into the kitchens and bathrooms. I'm very comfortable with kitchens and bathrooms, um, but I like to go to the utility area first because usually everything's in one area. You know, the furnace, water tank, electric panel, usually are all very close to each other, all right? So what I'm looking for on a furnace, for example, is I want to find the, the manufacturer's uh, it is either going to be a placard or a sheet of paper that's actually glued to a side panel. Sometimes it's on the front panel and you can look at it right there. Sometimes you have to take the front panel of the furnace off and you'll see it on the inside of that panel or on the inside of one of the side panels. Sometimes on the side panel on the outside itself. What you're looking for is a date. and you want to, I like to look for two dates. First date is a manufacturer date. And another date is the install date. So the manufacturer date could be a couple years old. You, somebody could have installed a furnace that may have already been one or two or three years old. It just was never, maybe it was bought and put in stores till, till needed, you know. A lot of builders buy a lot of inventory. So the reason I'm looking at that is I want to see how old the furnace is, okay. If that furnace is, is greater than 20 years old, I'm going to assume I'm going to put in a new furnace, okay. The other thing I look at too is whether you know, whether I find a date or not, I'm looking at the overall condition of the furnace. I'm looking for a lot of rust, discoloration, okay, things like that. Um, I'm going to open it up and see what I see, how dirty it is on the inside. Um, if the if I can determine the furnace is 15 years or younger, um, I might include a fee for an annual maintenance check. You know, you might put in there $500 just to be safe. Or maybe you have to change your motor. You might have to change a valve. At the minimum, you're going to be changing filters and so forth, okay? Um, and they could even clean out if it's if it's a not high efficiency. Sometimes they'll clean out the flu for you too for that for that same initial fee, all right? So uh, that's what I look for in furnaces. Again, none of this is meant to make you an expert. I never was an expert. I'm just using broad guidelines, and I also play it conservatively. So I, I don't assume something's working. I assume if it's old, even if it's working, it may need to be replaced in, in short order. So I'm going to go ahead and replace it. In the case of flipping, this is very important because when you're flipping a home, let's say you put all, all kinds of money into the landscaping, into the kitchen, into the bathroom, and you ignored the utility areas. And all of a sudden, the furnace, even though it's working, looks really old. People coming through a house looking at a house where everything's been updated – and all of a sudden they see an old jalopy furnace, that might be enough to turn them away in a, in a tight market. It's not just, to, you know, the sellers aren't the only ones who are benefiting from this. The buyers are also still very picky right now. And if they're looking at other homes where everything's brand new, I can I can bet you most of those other homes will have new furnaces, even those have been remodeled. So you want to have a new, a new looking furnace, okay? All right, that's furnaces. Water tanks. And I would definitely write this down because this is one of the oldest tricks in the world when you're looking at a water tank. So if you're looking at a water tank, it doesn't matter. This is true whether it's electric or gas. There's going to be obviously the tank itself, and there's going to be a top cap and a bottom cap. And each of those has a rim around it. 
It, it basically is fit over the top of the water tank and usually has some rivets or screws, typically screws. Um, but what you're looking at there, guys, looking for there is the around the rim of the top rim. Look for signs of erosion or you know, corrosion, excuse me, um, or uh, basically calcification. You'll see like white chalky stuff. You might see green. You might see orange. Anything that looks like something that's oozing out of that seam. That's a real good indicator, indicator there's something wrong with the tank lining itself. But whenever you have a bad tank lining, you don't repair it. You just replace the furnace, the whole furnace, okay? Same thing on the bottom. There's usually a rim around the bottom. Look at the bottom rim and look for the signs of the same thing. You know, corrosion, uh, calcification, any discoloration, signs of anything seeping out, bubbling paint around that rim there. Um, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. And if I see any of those types of things, I'm going to assume I need a new water tank, all right? Um, now, the, the water tanks themselves also have manufacturing plates on them and or sometimes uh, pieces of paper glued um, or pasted on there. You want to look for the manufacturer's date, and if you're lucky, you'll also will find an install date. Now, water tanks are run the gamut. There's six-year warranty water tanks, and there's also all the way up to 15-year warranty water tanks. Um, you know, if I if I see a water tank that says it has a six-year warranty and the water tank's 12 years old, I'm going to assume I need a new water tank. All right. Okay. That's the H. That's the furnace and that's the water tank. Um, air conditioning typically there'll be a uh, basically up in the there'll be a coils up in the plenum. The plenum is up above the furnace itself, and in there you'll see a um, or, or excuse me emanating from that you'll see a copper tube usually wrapped in a like a black. Um, Almost, uh, what's that material called? Not um, uh, not styrofoam, but it looks sort of like that. You, that's going to lead to the outside. On the outside, you're going to have the actual condensing unit itself outside the house. If you look at that, hopefully people have cared for it over the years, covered it during the winter and so forth in the, in the case of northern states and Canada. And if you look in there, look for signs of rust and corrosion, all that kind of stuff, because that may need to be replaced. By the way, when you replace the AC on the outside, it's usually a good idea to replace the furnace on the inside too and vice versa. Uh, it's just going to be a cost saver to replace them both at the same time. And typically if you're going to, if one's going to go, it's usually not too far after that the other one's going to go too. So you might as well take care of them both. Uh, neoprene, thank you. <laughs> I should know that because I'm a surfer and I have uh, three or four wetsuits all made of neoprene. So I should know that. So thanks. I think that was, uh, in your, looks like that might be Michael. Your name got cut off there. Um, Let's see, somebody else chimed in here. This is Guy. Oh, hi, Guy. Good to see you. Um, but here's For everybody up in Ontario, thanks, Guy, for putting this in there. There is a website. It's www.ontariocontractors.com. So that's ontariocontractors.com slash costs, C-O-S-T-S dot H-T-M. And that gives construction costs in Ontario. Thank you very much, Guy, for that. Um, let's see here. Or you got to the oh, electric panel. Okay. Now we're two, we're in 2015. Okay. Breakers have been out for quite a while now. Breaker panels. Even some of the breaker panels I've seen have been so dated that they've had to be replaced. So when you're looking at the breaker panel, this is your electrical panel. Okay. What you're doing you're doing is you're looking for signs of corrosion. Um, missing slots. In other words, you open up the panel, you've got your breakers, and if you see a bunch of empty spaces, that's a, that's actually a code violation um, because it's an electrical hazard. You could actually stick your hand in there or a screwdriver and, and really uh, do some harm to yourself. But uh, breaker panels, as long as they're in good shape and they're breakers, I'm usually not going to get too excited about the age of something. As long as it's it's functional, it looks good, and it's breakers, I'm okay. But if I open it up and I see the old fuses, the old glass fuses, or I see the old push-button breakers, um, at that point I may go ahead and replace, or I will go ahead and replace the panel. I might not necessarily have to rewire the house, but I certainly will replace the panel, okay? Now, this is very important. This is for everybody anywhere across North America, U.S. and Canada. Almost always now, and this is this this started a couple years ago. There was a, a a code that was passed, and the code said this: if you replace the panel, you also have to replace the service line coming in from the outside to the panel, and you also have to replace the meter. 
Okay, it's a that's a big deal. So you're not only you're not only talking about five or six hundred dollars to replace a panel. Now you're talking about potentially fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars to replace a service line and a meter on the outside. Um, it, it doesn't mean you have to replace the line coming down from the street or what's called the weather head. That's a separate matter. Okay, that's determined by the electric company. Um, but in any case, that's what we're looking for on the electric panel. So, so now what we're doing is we're going to move into what people call the money rooms, and that's your kitchens and bathrooms. Okay. Um, so, but so far, let me do a quick check here. Everybody okay with the, the kind of the guidelines I've given you for the outside and the utility areas of a property? And the best way to uh, get used to this is to practice. Matter of fact, I'll just tell you the first the first three properties I did. This was years and years ago. I actually paid an inspector to go out with me and not only do an inspection but give me instruction. I paid him to give me instruction on what it is I'm looking for when I'm going through houses. It was money well spent. Um, and you might want to encourage your uh, your investor to do this because remember, you shouldn't be doing this stuff. It's your investors that should be doing this. I'm simply giving you this information so you can share it with your investors. But one of the smartest things I've ever done is I paid that inspector first three times. I learned an awful lot. I learned exactly what to look at, what I'm looking for, what the danger signs are. And it was uh, money well spent. So, in any case, um, in fact, if if you look at a lot of inspector reports, a lot of times they're they're being non-committal. They're saying, you know, I'm not sure, but I believe this could be a problem. <laughs> and it scares the daylights out of buyers, but that's what they do. Okay, so moving into the money rooms, let's move into the kitchen first because kitchens generally will cost more than a bathroom to remodel. What I'm looking for in a kitchen is I want to see something that looks like it's within the last you know, 10 years or 12 years, depending on uh, where you are in the country. Um, I don't want to see cabinetry that's the old, cheap, um, compressed board cabinetry, not when I'm flipping a home. Um, if I see that, I'm going to generally rip that kitchen right out of there and put a brand new kitchen in. Um, now, having said that, I I've, I've have worked on many homes where I actually kept the cabinetry, the base cabinetry, because it was solid and sound and replace the door and drawer fronts. So I want you guys to write that down. You can do a wonderful job on a kitchen without replacing the original base cabinetry. Keep the base cabinets there, the framework in other words, and simply replace the door and drawer fronts, which means you also replace the doorknobs and, and drawer, the drawer front knobs, and also the countertop, and also the sink itself, okay? I want that kitchen to look like it's brand new, whether it's new or not. Um, if the cabinetry is so bad and old, obviously I'm going to rip out the entire kitchen and start from scratch. Um, now, kitchens could be kind of tricky because a lot of people are going to want to go to um, the the kitchen installers that are advertising on television, and they spend a lot of money on advertising on television, which means you're going to, they're going to charge you a lot of money. What I like to do is find um, local craftsmen who are pretty darn good at cabinetry um, that will let me pick out, even purchase my own cabinetry, have it shipped to the house, and have them install it, okay? Um, and, and pay them per square foot. Generally, that's what I'll do, pay them per square foot. That's a lot less expensive way to get a nice-looking kitchen. You don't have to spend a lot of money on kitchens. We've just been conditioned to think that we have to because, <laughs> you know, all those guys advertise this fancy stuff, and a lot of it, you know, the basic thing is this with kitchens. You want it to look nice and new and clean, but it doesn't have to be the top end best of everything. You definitely want uh, new new door and drawer knobs at a minimum. You want a nice looking counter. I, I like granite. I like um, uh, there's all kinds. I've seen marble countertops. Um, I have seen some pretty good formica countertops, but generally speaking, I'm going to go with granite. Okay, um, on any almost any flip. All right. And the sink definitely replace that. And on the faucet, here's what I do on the faucet, guys. Um, I learned th uh, through a lot of years of experience working with plumbers that the product called American Standard is the only product that you and I as consumers, when we get off the shelf at Home Depot and Lowe's, is the same product that the plumbers get at the plumbing supply houses. It's the only manufacturer that does that. Every other manufacturer, you know, Moen, for example, what you and I get as consumers at the hardware store is not the same product that the that the plumbers get at the plumbing supply house, okay? I also like American Standard because they honor their warranty. 
not, and not only that, they don't need the honor because they make a pretty solid product. It's, it's heavy metal. I mean, when you pick up a, a new faucet in a box, if it feels light, it's going to be too cheap, and it's not going to it's not going to work out. You want to get something that has some weight to it, real copper, real metal. Okay. Um, now what I do is I get usually a basic model. Uh, on a flip, I'll get a model that may have a um, one arm, you know, one handle that's controlling the hot and flow, the cold and the flow, and and also a dispenser for soap and also a hose. I just get those three things, and that's exactly what most people want, and they're happy with it. Okay. Um, I like double bowl sinks. They tend to, to uh, get a better response than the old single bowl sinks. Um, now, let's see here. That's cabinetry. That's counters. That's the faucet. That's the sink. That's the door and drawer knobs. Okay. On flooring in kitchens, I, I don't like the sheet flooring. Okay. I, if I'm going to flip a home, I want tile or wood. Tile is usually uh, more less expensive than wood. wood. Wood does look awesome. I love wood in my own home. With tile, what happens with tile is you can go to a tile supply place, a, a supply house, and look for the uh, last year's model. You'll see them out on pallets, and they're giving them away usually at half price or less. Sometimes you'll see them in the big box stores, you know, Home Depot and Lowe's. But more often than not, if you go to places like Tile City that's all over North America, um, they'll have pallets of stuff that, are, that they no longer make, so they, they just want to sell the inventory they have, and you can get enough to do a kitchen, okay? So I like tile. Um, now you've got a nice sharp looking kitchen and I've seen kitchens done that are 12 by 12 that were done for less than $10,000, all th everything brand new, the cabinetry, including the cabinetry, by the way, I've seen a lot of remakes, uh, basically, uh, face overs or what they call, it's a makeover, but they call it a face over because you're doing just the door and drawer fronts with new knobs and new countertop. I've seen those done, you know, almost always for less than $5,000. Okay. Okay. Um, that's the kitchen. Now let's move into the bathroom. On the bathroom, um, almost always I'm, I'm going to really just rip it out and start from scratch, unless it's really new. Okay. So what I'm looking for is same thing in the kitchen. I don't want to see cabinetry that's beat up and dinged up and looks like it's greater than 10 years old. If it is, I'm going to put a brand new sink base in uh, with countertop. You could usually get them for a few hundred dollars. I'm definitely going to do tile floor. Okay. Um, in the bathroom and on the tub uh, I might keep the tub itself as long as it's decent and good repair in other words there's no chips or dings in a tub I will keep the tub but I usually will put in a new tub surround and I won't do this I won't do the panels guys I know it's tempting to do the panels because you think you're saving money but I promise you if you do tile in the bathtub area you'll get much more favorable responses from your from your buyers the people looking to buy your flip okay um, and again, I will, I will also replace what's called a diverter kit in the in the tub shower enclosure. Your faucet head, the knob, the handle, all that stuff, that's considered your diverter kit. You replace a diverter kit, and you get all the other stuff thrown in for, thrown in for the same price, okay, in the same box. Um, that way, you've got a nice new – the tub is where it's all at, guys. The, guy, the tub is where it's at. Put that new tile in the tub with the with this plumbing, and you'll have a nice-looking tub. I promise you that, okay? Put in a nice new sink base, and they're inexpensive. They're really easy to do, okay? Um, also, the toilets, for $250, I can get an awesome American Standard toilet with all the new modern features, and, uh, and then, of course, you got to pay for it to get it installed, okay? Um, so there's not much to do in bathrooms, but what you can do can have a pretty dramatic effect. So let's stop here. We've just done kitchens and bathrooms. Let me check for questions here one second. Let's see. Um, okay, this is uh, Pat. Hi, Pat. Uh, you're asking about appliances. You know, that, that's a good question. You know what's funny is um, I do supply appliances in my flips. I've had a number of people say that they don't supply appliances in their flips. I don't understand that. I, I, I think it's geographic, but wherever I've done my, my investing and where I've worked with people directly, we definitely pr provided appliances. So right now, um, stainless steel is still a hot product when it comes to refrigerators and stoves. And I'll give you a big, giant hint on getting uh, kitchen appliances, okay? Um, and I'm not pushing these products. I don't get anything out of this, guys, honestly. I don't get a single thing out of pushing these products. These are just the products I've used over the years that got me the best results. So on appliances, I use uh, Sears Whirlpool appliances, okay? Um, matter of fact, all the appliances basically are made by one manufacturer. It's called White, and uh, they make everything, every, you know, from um, – 
Whirlpool, the GE, the Maytag. I forget all the companies that they're really that they're really um, uh, manufacture. I've always had real good luck with GE and Whirlpool. Maytag's top end; you're going to pay more money for it. But Whirlpool has been an absolute standard for years, and their products look great. They work great. They're very affordable. Um, you go to Sears. Look for look for the sales on Sears. Always keep a keep a matter of fact. Set yourself up on Sears uh, with your email address so you get notified of these of all these tremendous sales they have. I've got I've gotten appliances there uh, for half price. Okay, from Sears delivered and everything for half price. And I always look for that. And if I if I'm really happy with what I'm getting, I actually will stock up and buy a few extras and keep them in storage. Okay. Um, yes, you can get appliance from Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, I've done that too, but I almost always just go right back to Sears and get those uh, Whirlpool appliances. They work great. They almost never break down, um, and they look great, okay? And yes, stainless steel is still hot. Now, you want to get the kind of stainless steel that has a finish on it, and I forget the name of the finish, but it's easily cleanable, so it doesn't get dingy over time after use. Um, it holds up a lot better than uh, some other manufacturers, okay? Okay. Um, Okay, let's check and see. If that's uh, okay. That was that questionnaire. Now let's move into uh, the other rooms, and this is now we're getting to the easy part. What I do now when I go into, let's say I go down the hallway to look at the bedrooms, I'm looking at the trim of the doorways and the doors themselves, and replacing a door panel is really not all that expensive. You can get you can get the doors themselves. Not the framing, just the actual door. You've got to hang on new hinges, um, usually for $75 or less. You can get them as low as $35. I wouldn't buy those because they're too cheap. But you can get nice doors, okay, and then get a nice doorknob, an interior bedroom doorknob, for about 12 bucks a piece. Decent ones. Not the, Don't get the cheap ones. Get nice ones. Sometimes you can get a contractor's pack and get a, a, a a bulk price or a package deal. Okay, um, you want to want those. You want those door and doorknobs to look great. Okay. Um, now, when you go into the bedrooms, there's not much really to look at other than the wall surfaces, the ceiling, and the flooring. Generally, what I'll do is, if unless the ceiling light or ceiling fan or ceiling fan light combination is really really brand spanking new, I'm going to replace them because they're pretty inexpensive to replace. I want it to look new. I want everything to look new. That house might be 50 years old, but when people go into it, everything is going to look new, okay? Um, I also will absolutely repaint all the wall surfaces. If there's any damage, you want to repair that first. Now, on wall paint, I know eggshell will hide defects more easily. However, I like a satin paint on the walls, okay? And I also like a trim done in different a different shade. Same basic family of color, just a different shade, okay? Um, you can also get paints a lot less expensively by going to uh, the paint the paint dealers and look for their discards. Usually they'll sell big you know, big pallets, five gallon buckets of paint. Um, I, I love the uh, the the mellow pastels. In other words, the color of the desert sand, for example, you might do on the wall surfaces and then do a um, like some type of an off white, but use semi gloss on the trim. So you want to do two tone. Do the walls one color usually in satin, and do your trim in a semi-gloss, either a lighter, usually lighter than the wall color, okay? That's a great combination. Do it on all the trim, and then finally do the carpeting. Definitely always replace, unless that carpeting is brand spanking new, no stains, no um, no wear, no tread, um, tread marks, no wear spots, I'm going to replace the carpeting. And I like using Shaw, the manufacturer is called Shaw, and the, and the, the, type of carpet is called candy truffle shawl candy truffle it's a 10-year warranty carpet okay you can get usually three different piles I won't get the most expensive pile but I'll get the middle grade what I will do is I will upgrade on the padding I want a good pad underneath that carpet okay don't get a cheap cheap padding um, a good a good grade padding will actually make the carpet look better and extend its lifespan okay um, and by the way, the same thing, the same, what I just described there, same thing in the living room, okay? Same thing, living room and dens and family rooms that are on the first floor. Same thing with the paint, same thing with the carpeting, same thing with the doors and the doorknobs, okay? And same thing with the ceiling, the ceiling light and fan fixtures, okay? Um, 
as you can imagine, the inside of this house is going to look pretty darn new by the time I'm done with it, okay? And it is. That's the effect I want to have. So, in any case, um, I want to mention something back on the front door. The front door, I like to have at least a side light panel or a cutout on the door in the door itself or like a window, over window, something like that, um, tinted. I want that front door to look really spectacular with a nice new doorknob because, remember, it's the first thing people touch when they come in. Um, to look at it for them buying the house that they're actually going to live in, okay? Um, in any case, um, that's the scoop on that stuff. I, I, I'm not going to get too much into um, the details of plumbing because what you can do is when you're in there looking, actually, i just tell you what you what you look for in plumbing. Um, hopefully, the water is on in the house that you're looking at, and what you can do is go around and, and turn on all the faucets and then turn them off. And look and see it to make sure the water comes out, everything's fine, make sure it drains okay. And look for staining. Look underneath the cabinetry and look for staining. And then go into your basement if you have a basement. Look underneath where those, where those uh, sink bases were and showers and toilets and look for a lot of staining and discoloration, okay? Um, when you're looking at piping, the actual supply lines, the water lines coming into the fixtures, Look, look again for signs of corrosion around the joints, elbows, um, valves, things like that, shutoff valves. If you see a lot of um, calcification, a lot of, a lot of you know, green coloring and all kinds of discoloration and signs of uh, moldy stuff, that's usually a sign that those, those joints and those unions have started to go bad and you need to have those replumbed. Um, any case, uh, okay, we talked about electrical, plumbing, HVAC, wall surfaces. Um, let's go back and check for questions here. Um, okay, this is from Pat Callahan. Hi, Pat. Okay, do you prefer do you prefer wood flooring over carpet in living or dining room, or do just or do just replace what's already there? Okay, uh, Pat, that's an excellent question. I generally like carpeting because a brand new carpeting always looks and feels so good. However. I will tell you this. I, I did have my own personal preference when I was actively flipping, and that is in the in the living rooms and dining rooms, that's actually a good place to have wood flooring. If it's already there, you can have it refinished. It, refinishing typically can cost you more than actually carpeting, to be honest with you. Refinishing a good floor the right way um, can be a, a little expensive, but if it looks good, boy, it's going to really look sharp, and a lot of people really prefer that in living rooms and dining rooms. However, now, and Pat, I want to uh, emphasize this. I always put uh, carpeting in the bedrooms, okay? So even if you have an all wooden floor and, you know, and, and the entire house, I still like carpeting in bedrooms because I found that most consumers prefer carpeting in bedrooms, okay? Almost everywhere, whether it's US and Canada, it's always you put the carpeting in the, in the bedrooms. And then they're okay with the wood floor out in those living areas because they'll put like a throw rug or something like that. Um, it just looks nicer. looks better. And it's very complimentary, by the way, to tile. So a lot of times your tile in the kitchen is going to butt up against the wood floor in a dining room, and it's a sharp contrast. It looks pretty awesome, okay? Um, in any case, good question. So I wanted to give you that rundown on really what it's like to do a, um, a physical analysis on a flip. Um, next week, perhaps, we'll have time to go into what you do when you're doing a physical analysis on rentals, because even though you go through the same sequence of steps, um, your your improvements are going to be of a different nature. You're going to improve a rental differently than you'll improve a flip. The only reason I did flips tonight is we're doing the very first um, flip webinar Monday night, and I wanted to kind of... Uh, get everybody primed for that for those of you who are involved in that. So what I'm going to do right now, guys, is kind of switch gears, and I want to talk about a marketing technique to drum up some new clients, okay? Um, now, before I do, let me check for questions here real quick again. Um, okay, what are your thoughts on sump pumps? And this is Lou. Hi, hi Lou. How are you? Um, Lou, sump pumps uh, typically are only required when you have an internal French drain in the basement, or garage or the or the bottom most floor of a house that say it's like a slab that's ground floor I've never seen one apparently they make them they have them in people's with slab homes but usually you'll see them in, in houses with basements so wherever you have and it's usually an older home where you see some signs of moisture around the perimeter of your basement where the floor meets the wall and where the the corners where the walls join 
a lot of times that's just uh, the foundation is so old that water has begun, has begun to penetrate. And so what a good contractor would do is they will no longer go outside and dig up the outside of the house and put it in an external drain. They'll come in and use a giant sawzall, cut up the basement floor around the perimeter, about a, a, a foot wide swath, lay in an internal French drain, and at the lowest point, install a sump pump, okay, so that the water has a place to go, and then they pump it out through a sewer line um, out into the through the system, okay? So it's not a really a matter of whether I, I like them or not. I just, um, they are necessary in certain parts of North America. Um, I've seen them up in Canada. I've seen them up in New England. I've seen them in Pennsylvania and Ohio, um, West Virginia, Virginia, uh, um, Maryland. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't know that I've seen any in California. Of course, in California, they, they don't have moisture because they don't have any rain. <laughs> so, of course, that could change. But let's hope that it changes for all of our California brothers and sisters because, boy, they sure do need rain. My cousin Krista told me they're having a horrible time right now with, with uh, forest fires out there. It's just absolutely devastating. So, in any case, back to sump pumps. Um, uh, they're, when they're necessary, they're necessary. And, by the way, Lou, that's actually a code item. Um, so if you ever find yourself in a situation with a client where it looks like a sump pump may be required, uh, just make sure they have a contractor who can verify that they're following the, the code on that because there are some, definitely some code requirements on those things, um, particularly because you're tied into some type of an existing sewer system, and you want to make sure it's tied into the right one. There's usually a, you know storm sewer and also wastewater sewer systems. And around around the world now, they're all around North America, they're, just, they're all being separated. Even the older ones, all of the codes are required them to be separated everywhere in, in North America. So good question. Okay. What I want to do now, guys, is I want to switch gears. I want to get into a little bit of marketing because I want to give you a technique that is very, very powerful. And, and hey, Lou, by the way, Lou, can, can you give me a call um, tomorrow, anytime after um, maybe between 7 and 8 tomorrow night? Because I'm going to be on the road. I want to, I want to help you get your, your workshop launched because that's what, this is what made me think of it. The next technique, guys, has to do with a workshop, okay? And every, everybody on the webinar here, at least, at least a lot of you guys, has already done your first workshop. And you see the value in it. Many of you, uh, I don't know if Francis, you're on or not, but um, you, you know that you got to repeat that every single month. And it just grows and grows and grows, and you get more and more business. Well, the next technique is based on the same principle. You want to get new investors or newer investors involved here in a community-oriented workshop at your local library, church, or municipal building. Um, you know, you can also use your own office, but sometimes people, when they come up to an office and they see a big real estate sign outside, like 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 you know Keller Williams, they might um, be a little apprehensive. They might, you might have a little bit of a mental hurdle to overcome when you're in your in your workshop. But the workshop in this case is based on education platform. Okay, so what I want you to do is. Um, you're, you're going to do the same setup. You've got to get a room, but it's going to be free. You're not going to charge money for this. Over time, you can actually, I used to actually charge money for this after I did it for a couple of years. I realized how valuable it was. So I would invite people in who had an interest in investing, and they just simply wanted to learn in a non-threatening way, okay, in a safe environment that was warm and friendly, and there were the people in the room who perhaps they even knew each other. They might have even known each other. Um, and also was either no or low cost because they're all being bombarded with, with these programs now where people are charging, you know, ten, twenty-five, thirty-five thousand dollars $35,000 for coaching programs on how to flip homes and how to buy rentals. It's just crazy. Um, I mean, I can teach you all that stuff, and it won't cost you nearly that. So in any case, what you want to do is um, when you find these people, Always, always, again, start with your own uh, your own contact management system, your own database of, of clients. And if you haven't done it yet, you guys really need to, to do this, is go through your database and look at each client, ask yourself how you know them and what you know about them, and then rank them on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being least likely to invest and 10 being most likely to invest. In your first workshop, before you spend any money on marketing, just just email and call all the people that you ranked six through ten, you know, being most likely to want to invest, okay? Call them up, email them. I prefer phone calling. It's okay to follow up with an email. I prefer phone calling people, actually. You can email them first to give them your, your basic pitch on this educational workshop and then follow up with an email. 
and invite them to, you know, again, the school, the library, or the municipal building, whatever night you want to do. And tell them this is going to be a one-month-long series. You're going to do this one night a week for, for three weeks, and then you're going to do a Saturday on the last Saturday of the month. All right? So the first one you're going to do is your first workshop is going to be based on flips. That's what I always do because it – People are always excited about flips. They want to flip homes and make a whole bunch of money, and everybody, uh, fewer people like looking at the rentals, which I think is sad because I made far more money on my rentals over time than I ever made on flips, okay? Um, two, two different strategies. So in any case, you want to invite them and tell them what you're going to do. Tell them you're going to bring in um, examples of properties that have been for sale in the area that you thought might make good flip opportunities, okay? And you're going to do your you're going to do your own homework first. I know this runs counter to what I teach. You're this time you are going to do the work. You're going to do the analysis, and you're going to fill out all the sheets and do everything you can up front to prepare for this this educational workshop. When you come to the workshop, come prepared with your set of information, your set of data. You're not going to hand it out there. What you're going to hand out is the listings themselves of the properties, and if they're not even listed, let's just say you discovered them from looking at the um, uh, tax assessment database, or you simply by driving by and you went to the courthouse to find information on the property. Okay, um, up in Canada, you, you have to you can use uh, uh, GIS data and, and Geo Warehouse to um, to find this information. Also, you can go to the county courthouse up there too, or the municipal courthouse up in uh, Ontario. Um, any case. You find your subject properties, you do the analysis, you keep that to yourself because you're going to use that as your own kind of teacher's guide. In your workshop, what you're going to do is you're going to hand out the, the property information, whether it's a listing or whatever you have a printout from the computer of a tax assessment um, uh, screen. And then you're going to give them a blank one of these. You're also going to give them, um, uh, you know, the other blank forms. Let's see. Let me go back. And, whoops. Hopefully, uh, yeah. These are all given to you in your system. Bring these along with you, okay? And what you're going to do is you're going to walk them through the analysis of the property. Even though that you're not physically at the property, you're going to go through the motions as if you were at the property. They have them exercise these sheets and end up with this sheet here. I'm getting to here in a second, the one we just looked at, where they're going to actually fill in the dollars and cents, okay? You're going to have them practice doing a rehab or sorry, doing a physical analysis on a flip property. Now at the same time, if you think about it, you've also got um, your ARV and your MEO formulas. You want to bring that along too, which is right, uh, let's see, that's going to be further up, I'm sorry. Well, you know what I'm talking about. You know the maximum allowable offer worksheet. That's prior to all these forms. Um, let's see if we can get to it quickly here. You want to have them practice that maximum allowable offer worksheet too. On flips, it's very easy. Because all it is is you're, you're at the repair value, which is the value of the property after it's been remodeled, less your overhead and profit, 30%, less your repairs gives you the MEO. This is what we covered last week, remember? Um, and that should be right up here somewhere. In any case, um, you want to have them practice all of this, okay? Now, you do have to come prepared, guys. You have to come prepared with your own analysis and your your own – you got to have comps. Show them that you've determined – Predetermine the value of this property. It's at the repair value after remodeling based on your information on the neighborhood. So come prepared. I want you to practice this because you need to practice it anyways. All right. And you're going to now show them what you did and help them through this process. Okay. So, so far, let me do a quick check here and see if everybody understands the format I'm describing. Um, actually, here's a question here. Uh, this is Francis, Francis Berry. Hey, Francis, how you doing? All right, guys, we've got a veteran on the, on the line here. Okay, yes, I am on in the process of getting a plan to structure the mid-fall workshops to have members of the group help to contribute to the meeting on a regular basis. I want to build a core so the workshop is more sustainable. Francis, I'm so glad you're on here because I'm going to have you do the same thing. Um, the guy's name is Ron up in uh, the Boston area. Um, Ron, I thought, was an excellent candidate for doing one of these classes, and I've come up with a few others here in Pennsylvania, and since you're a Pennsylvania guy, I'm going to suggest you do the same thing. So, so, so Francis, this is an excellent format for you to build on your experience, because I know you've done workshops before. Um, 
In fact, I think your your very first workshop, I think you exceeded capacity and had over 20 people there, I think. Um, but in any case, same basic uh, uh, front end piece. All you're going to do now is at your meeting, instead of being an open forum, you're going to you're going to make it an educational platform. You're going to walk these people through all of these sheets, okay? And again, the format is this: the first week, I like to do flips. The second week, I like to do rental properties. And next week, we'll we'll do that. Let me just make a note here, as I keep keep talking about next week. And next week is going to be Tuesday night. So let's see, Tuesday night, we're going to go over rental. Um, physical analysis, okay. Let me write that down. And we're also going to go over um, workshop number two, which is analyzing rental properties, okay. So we'll do that. So by the in the next couple of weeks, you guys will have your format and your structure down for pr putting together your own investor workshop where you're actually teaching them the fundamentals of investing, okay. Um, and you talk about developing rapport. In developing camaraderie and loyalty um, also it gets them inspired and also gets them involved they're rolling up their sleeve and the more involved you can get your clients the more inclined they are to follow through in investing they will find a way to invest this is one of the most awesome techniques you could possibly come up with um, and I'm glad to share it with you so in any case that's the format of the very first workshop now at the end of the night, a lot of times people they're going to come right up to you and say, "Hey, I, I I really like this. You know, how do I get started?" And there's your clients right there. Okay, um, you might find at your second workshop when you're doing rentals that you get new people and different people coming into the rentals. Okay, and the, a lot of the people who came for the flips are no longer interested in in uh, they're not interested in doing rentals. So you get a mixed bag of people. You get some repeat people and you get some new people. It's just kind of interesting. Okay. Um, but I love this format. It's one of my most favorite ones, and it's probably the one I did over the longest period of time. I just I didn't start off doing this. I started off doing the, the basic stuff, okay? Because I didn't it, I didn't consider it until I had some experience under my belt, and I realized just like Kelly O'Keefe did, and you're going to get the Kelly O'Keefe uh, interview next month, okay? That's going to come out in October. Same thing. She did the same kind of thing, and she never she doesn't invest, okay? So that's what I mean. You guys can do this. So for Lou and and Francis. And I don't know if, uh, Ron, you're on or not, but uh, give me a shout out. Let me know what your feeling is about what I just described there, okay? Um, let's see here. Somebody just said, um, okay, it looks like we're okay. Somebody just said they, they couldn't hear anything. Hang on one second. Um, okay, microphone. Okay, mic is working on my end, guys, um, but it doesn't mean it's working on your end. Let me check back here and see if... Um, Anybody else has got the same comment? Um, nope. So for everybody is okay. Thank goodness. So if uh, Gary, I don't have this rehab cost estimate worksheet. Can you provide this in a soft copy, uh, Emily? Um, Emily, if you could do me a favor, if you can shoot an email to me and copy Beverly, um, you should have it. But perhaps it didn't. You didn't get it when. Um, I think you're on the new platform on the on the website platform where you get your information delivered to you directly from going to the online. It's called Digital Chalk, and perhaps you didn't see it there or it just didn't get dropped down. So if you could email Beverly and copy me, we'll make sure we get that to you because this is an awesome chart and it's an awesome format to use when you're when you're rehabbing properties. Okay, um, let's see. Any other? Uh, okay, so it looks like well, obviously the 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 sound is working again. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. One quick tidbit here. It's 803, and I think I know a lot of people told me they want to watch the, the debate in Donald Trump versus the world. But there's one more thing I want to mention to you guys, okay? And when it comes to marketing, there's a lot of electronic tools out there at our disposal. And everybody has knows about Facebook and Twitter, and you don't have to spend a whole lot of money on those things or LinkedIn. But everybody should get set up to have some online presence. And when you have something that comes up like a new listing or you want to promote a property you thought was very good, just promote it. Promote it on your on your social media and promote it to your sphere of influence and say, look, look at this property I just discovered. I think it's a, I think it would make sense if you want to take take a look at it or check it out, let me know. But what I'm driving at here is, is YouTube. So few people use YouTube and it is so easy to use. All you do is you go on a YouTube. It's, it's user friendly. I'm not going to walk you through it right now for the sake of time, but set up your own account. It's free. It takes 
literally less than a minute. So anybody on the on the call here, let me know if some of you guys already have a YouTube channel. It's, again, it's easy to do. It's free. And nowadays with the smartphones, you can actually go to a property, and let's say you're walking through it, and it's your listing. You want to sell it. You can walk through it, uh, demonstrate the property, particularly if it's a flip or even a rental property. Describe it as you're walking through it, and if it's a rental, describe the income and expenses as you're walking through it, and put it, do it on your phone. Just do it on your smartphone. You don't have to have any, any fancy special equipment. Like I've got some, some nice equipment, but you can do this on your phone. And then right there on the spot, you can upload it directly to YouTube. <laughs> okay? Create your description. Get it loaded to YouTube, and then promote the YouTube video on your Facebook page, on your LinkedIn page, on your Twitter page, and also to your database via email, all right? Now, I, what I just gave you there was a whole lot of information in a few short sentences, but that's exactly and literally what it takes to do it. So let me look for a quick shout out here on um, using YouTube to promote properties, particularly if you have your own listings. Now, let's say you're out with a, um, you're out with a client and they're they're looking at properties to buy themselves and they've done all the rehab they did all the work not you and the they look at six they only buy one and yet three of them look like really good deals let them know that Jay if, if you get this one deal if you don't mind I'd like to promote this to my other clients and I don't have to disclose that I always do as a courtesy I go back and YouTube video those other two properties do the quick analysis on it while I'm walking through it just this is what I think it would fetch in the way of rent or in a way of a flip on an ARV, load it up to YouTube, put it out on the social media sites, do it up through my email, and I've sold a lot of properties just by doing that, guys, not even my own listings, and I've done that. So let's see, um, do you need owners or renters permission to take pictures of properties for YouTube? And this is Pat Callahan. Um, well, when I've done this, Pat, typically the places were empty, okay? Um, in the case of owner, they absolutely want you to do this. So I mean, you, you always want to disclose what you're doing. Always, definitely check with them and say, look, you know, I'd like to do a YouTube video to, to sell your property. Is that okay? All right. And by the way, when people sign listing agreements, typically they're giving you carte blanche permission to do whatever you can do to market that property. Okay. And usually it'll list all the different media that you're going to be using. Um, so also when something goes out on the MLS and it's, and it's, uh, in the listing agents promoting it, you're, you also are allowed to forward that information to your sphere, to your database. In fact, that's what you should be doing. You should be forwarding these listings to your clients, okay? And you can do that by way of a YouTube video. I've seen it done a, a million times. Now, you know, you might want to call the other agent and say, hey, I just I like your property so much. I want to do a quick YouTube video and shoot it out to my sphere. That's different than, should, than broadcasting it to um, – to the world. Sending it to your sphere is ethical and, and perfectly correct, okay? What you don't want to do is, is take somebody else's property, promote it uh, broadly, or do a blanket campaign to people that you don't know. You only want to send it to people that you do know, okay? People on your sphere, in your sphere on your database, and people in your social media circles, okay? That's okay. Um, let's see. Uh, if you're looking to sell a rental property that's already occupied, I don't know that I've ever done that. Um, let's see, that was Pat. Um, in that case, I would definitely tell the tenant, "Hey, we're going to be we're going to be taking pictures here to promote this property because it's for sale." And the, generally speaking, the owner has the right to do that. You have the right to take photos of any property that you're going to sell. Okay. Um, Let's see. This is Emily Gary. You mentioned that the workshop is four weeks. What do you do? Cover. Oh, so Emily, in week three, I cover wholesaling. Now, for those of you who know me personally, you know I'm really not a big fan of wholesaling. In fact, I, I just don't like it. I am required to teach it, and I do teach it. Um, and I'm glad to teach it because a lot of people are doing it incorrectly. So that's the third week is wholesaling. And the fourth week, Emily, is actually in the field. You take the fourth week, go out on a Saturday and get some properties lined up and go look at them with your students, okay? That's one of the most awesome things you can possibly do. And, and there's another technique I developed called a bus tour that, that's evolved from that Saturday event. And I'll, I'll, I actually covered bus tours before back in the summer, but I'll cover them again if you guys want to maybe in the next couple of weeks. But on Saturday, you have everybody show up at the first property, and you let them walk through together. 
Then you go to the next property, maybe take three properties, minimum three and no more than six. Six More than six is too many. Have them go through and do the actual physical analysis. Have them go home and check their homework and see if you don't actually sell some properties that day, Emily. That's one of my most favorite techniques because throughout the process of teaching the class, by the time we get to the fourth week, they're excited, they're motivated, they're inspired. Um, they figured out how they're going to get some money, and they'll actually will buy some of these properties. You don't be surprised if you get a couple of transactions out of that fourth day, which is, again is a Saturday. You know, um, so excellent question, good follow-up question. Okay, guys, it is 10 after 8. Um, that's what I wanted to cover tonight. And I'll look. I'll keep it open for one more minute here to look for more uh, questions. And if not, I really appreciate you guys being here. I love this, and tonight was one of my most favorite nights because I got to talk about. The, the more thorough physical analysis of a flip. Um, also, that, that marketing technique I want you guys to think about. If you want to consider doing the educational workshop is your launch, um, by all means, uh, let me know. We'll, we'll do it on your strategy call. We'll walk you through the sequence, the, the sequence of events, the steps, okay? And, uh, and again, if I'm ever in the area, uh, please remember, I'll be glad to help you out. So just a quick, speaking of being in the area, um, Next week I will be in Virginia, um, Falls, let's see, Fairfax and Reston. The, the week after I'll be in uh, Michigan for one day, Detroit, Michigan on Monday night. Then I'll go to Montreal on Wednesday for a five-day event where I'm actually speaking. Um, then I go for my own training in Austin, Texas, and then I go to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, where I teach on the 8th and 9th, and then I do a retreat for myself the next half of the week. We back in Detroit the 15th and 16th of, November, of October. Let's see, the week of the 19th of October, I will be in back in Pennsylvania, and the week of the 26th of October, I'll be back up in the New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts area. Okay, um, so keep that in mind, guys, and let me know what you're up to, and if I can uh, join you at any one of your workshops, or if you want to kick off a mastermind. Um, Oh, by the way, Emily and Michael, I'm, I'm, looks like I might be in Upper Marlboro, Maryland on October 23rd. I'm sorry, October 22nd. So keep that in mind, October 20, 22nd, Marlboro, Maryland. All right. Um, okay, guys, uh, that's pretty much it. I uh, hope you all have a great night. If you're watching the debate, enjoy it, and uh, hopefully your candidate kicks some butt. <laughs> all right, you guys take care and have a wonderful night. Bye-bye.